Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. As we approach the last days, and I truly believe we are, there is going to be more and more uncertainty. And when things are unknown, that lack of knowing, that uncertainty oftentimes produces concern and fear. In fact, fear is on the increase. We see that the world that we're living in, in many ways, is less safe. Crime in many places is rising significantly. There is uncertainty with jobs, which means one's financial future also has a degree of that which can be fearful. So when we look at the society, the location that we reside in, there is cause for fear. But if you have a covenantal relationship with God, that fear is not going to have a negative influence upon you. Those things that cause concern, those things that are uncertain, those things that people tend to worry about and fear for, those things are going to be motivations for coming before God, praying before Him, making known to Him one's requests, one's petitions, one's problems, and in the end, through that power of prayer, through experiencing God's presence in our life through this covenant, we can have, and this is such an important word, we can have assurance, a spiritual confidence. And when we look at the scripture that we're going to be studying in this lesson, David wrote it down as one who had many problems in his life, many people wanting to put him to death, many opponents and enemies. But David, he trusted in the Lord. He had assurance. So can you. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Psalms and Psalm 27. This Psalm is one of my favorites. This psalm is a message of hope, a message of encouragement, a message that tells us we need not fear. Now, that does not mean that there are not fearful things around us. There are. There are fearful things in this world. But the one who's with us being in a covenantal relationship with him, that one is greater. He is wiser. He knows all things, and he is all powerful. Like uh, the patriarchs knew, they called him El Shaddai, which means the God that is sufficient, who is enough. For what? For whatever is before us. God's greater. Look with me to verse 1. Psalm 27 and verse 1. The first thing that, that we are told is that this is a psalm of David. And as I said, David had many difficult experiences, many challenges, but God brought him through each of them. And those trying, difficult hardships that he experienced, they were a source of providing a greater understanding, experiencing God deeper in his life, and learning, learning about God's faithfulness. So, verse 1. Of David, and then David says, The Lord, 
my light and my salvation. Now we would say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Notice illumination is necessary. The word here for light involves revelation. And unless the Lord reveals, you won't have salvation. So the first thing that David says is, the Lord, he is a revelation, a source of illumination for me. And through that revelation, through his truth, this light, I have experienced salvation. David knows the salvation of the Lord. And because of that, he says, and many Bibles do not translate the literalness literalness of this, but he says, from whom shall I fear? What this scripture tells us is that there is no one since God is David's salvation. There is no one from whom David should fear. Likewise, he says, the Lord, and this is that four-letter name of God, the God who transcends all things, the God who was, is, and will be. We read the Lord. And then we have a word for strength. But it can also mean a strong place, a, a type of sure, mighty, reliable foundation. So David says, the Lord is the strength of my life. And then, obviously, this is a psalm. It is poetry, and we see parallelism. Now, I'm not going to be pointing out all what's parallel to one another throughout this psalm. Hopefully that you are growing in your knowledge of doing that for yourself. But in the same way he says earlier, the first part of this verse, from whom shall I fear? Now he says, from whom will I be afraid? And we have two different words that relate to fear, being afraid of something. And David boldly proclaims, because of the Lord being the strength of his life, giving him illumination, having received salvation, David says, there's not anyone from whom I need to be fearful of. It reminds me of this verse, perfect love cast out all fear. And when we receive God's love that is indeed perfect, we are not going to be plagued by fear. We may experience that fear, but as we turn to God, as we remember his attributes, his promises, what he has said to us, that fear is going to dissipate and we're going to move into thanksgiving, praise, and worship of him. Let's move on to verse 2. Now, as I said, David did not have this easy life, an absence of problems, no opposition, quite the contrary. Notice what he says here. When draws near unto me, who's drawing near to him? What's well, a word for evil ones, wicked ones. These are individuals that violate the will of God that are in opposition to the purposes, the plans of God. And because David is committed to God and God's purposes, he finds himself the, the source of, of, of these individuals' schemes and plots and attacks against him. So he writes, When draws near unto me wicked ones, evil ones, and why they're coming near? He says, to eat or to devour my flesh. And who are these? My opponents and my enemies. David has confidence. They, because they are violating the will of God, God is going to move against them. Now, that's just a very simple principle for all of humanity. When we violate the will of God, we are going to find ourselves in in opposition against God. We're going to be placing ourselves 
in opposition to this one who is almighty, this one who has unlimited resources, perfect knowledge, and that should tell us something. We don't want to be in that position. We want to be on his side. So it's not getting God on my side, it's me getting on his side. And how do I do that? Through a commitment to his will, following his instruction, his commandments. So when we are in that, serving God, then we can be assured that he is going to move in our defense. And that's why we read, they, these wicked ones, these evil ones, They will stumble, and literally, it's they have stumbled, and they will fall. Now, two different tenses. Why is that important? It's important because we see a process that leads to a result. God, right now, when someone is in opposition to him, they are in the process, they are stumbling. You may not see that, but God's at work. Be assured of that. In the future, whether that future is very soon or whether it's in the distant future, they will fall. And this term for falling, oftentimes in the scripture, and this would be one example of it, has to do with falling in defeat. So they are in a process. They are stumbling They're in the process that's going to lead to their defeat. But when you are in a covenantal relationship with God through faith in his Messiah, then we know something. We are in a process moving towards victory. So in my life, humanity, every person is moving in one direction, either to eternal defeat or eternal victory. And David knows where he's moving to. Verse verse 3. If shall camp against me, and many Bibles will have the noun here as army, but it's word mechane. It's a camp. Now, I agree, a camp of soldiers. So we see why it says army, but it's literally an encampment. There's a, a group of, of soldiers doesn't necessarily mean an entire army but there's a camp so there's a camp that is positioning itself camping against me and what does David say my heart will not fear now remember heart has to do with a thinking a thought process the mindset and David says it doesn't matter If a a camp of soldiers has positioned themselves against me, he says, my heart, meaning I will not think in a fearful way. I will not allow fear to be an influence in my life. Now, you may be afraid. You may be experiencing that which fears causes you to fear. But don't allow that fear to influence you. What is David doing? Well, he's writing down a psalm for worship. These are our writings that that were used to worship God. So we may fear fear something. We may feel, feel fear. What should we do? Worship God. And that is going to change our thought process into that which we should Verse 3, second half. And if shall rise against me, milchama. Now, milchama is a war. So if a war shall rise up against me, in this, and this is so important, in this, this situation, he says, I am trusting. Now, I've mentioned and many people, they, they do not pay attention to the grammatical constructions, and that is a shame. Because oftentimes, it's the grammar that marks things for the reader. And I have shared, maybe not too long ago, 
but I'll do it again, that when we see this type of construction, and I've made mention that, that the Christians tend to call it a present participle, where from the rabbinical world and, and Jewish uh, scholars in modern Hebrew call it the present tense. What you call it is not important. It's identifying it and identifying that it is infrequent. And whenever this grammatical construction is used, it, it usually marks this as something that's significant. So David says, in this, this situation when I'm in the midst of war, there's an encampment of soldiers against me. He says, in this, I am trusting. It's not in the future I will trust. He says, I'm doing it now. It's in the present so I am trusting. Verse 4. One, and this would imply one thing I have asked from the Lord. It I will seek. So we see two verbs, one for asking, another one for beseeching. And most would see the simple word lishol being a, a general asking. You may ask something that doesn't have great significance. But when you have the word levikesh, biblically, levikesh makes it more emphatic. It emphasizes the significance. So David writes, one implying one thing I've asked from the Lord. It I will seek. And what is that? Well, it's the word shafti from the word Yashav. It's a word for sitting or, or being located, and it's in the past tense. Now, most Bibles don't translate it in the past tense, and it may be hard. But what David is saying here is that this is something I have done. This is not a new thought that I've had. This is not something that I'm doing because of the current situation that I'm in. David says, this is something that I've asked in the past, and I will continue to seek ongoing. This is who I am. He says that I have sat in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. So he's revealing to us, this is who he is. And what do you do in the house of the Lord? It is an expression of worship. What David is interested in is worshiping God. Now, let me share with you a biblical truth. The more committed you are to worshiping God, the more the Bible is going to come alive for you. Meaning this, these promises are not going to be just something you've read, but you're going to experience his work, his promises, his presence, his power, his provision in your life. So let me ask you, where does worship, what type of, of, of place of prominence does worship have in your life? If it's not very high, if you don't put a, a degree of significance on you worshiping God, then realize something then these promises are going to seem to, to escape you. These things that David is revealing because he experiences them, you're not going to know them because you're violating, you're not following what David says. That this one thing that, that he has asked, that he has sought for, is that he might dwell in a permanent way, in a consistent. He says, I have dwelt in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and why? Two, and it's a word for vision, but it's a word of perception. We might translate it simply with the word for seeing, to see, to gaze upon the, the pleasantness. This is the word noam, a common name in Israel today, and it has to do with that which is pleasing to God. That which he is in agreement with, that, that is uh, uh, 
true. It's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, that which is good, holy, virtuous, right, praiseworthy. This is the concept of noam, that which is pleasant to the Lord. And he says, and to the word live a care, and to visit in his sanctuary, not the word temple, but his sanctuary, a reference to the vir habayat, that is the holy of holies. So we have this word hechal, very important. It is a place for something, a place that is dedicated for something. And it's a place in this use for that has been dedicated for the presence of God. And that's what David wants to experience. That is the one thing that he seeks, why he wants to be at the house of God, that he can experience God's presence in the sanctuary of God. Verse 5, For you have hidden me, literally, it's in the future, for you will hide me in the sukkah. Now, here we have the idea, sukko in this construction, of a, a portable, temporary structure. And what he's saying here is, you will hide me in this world. You will conceal me from the enemy. Now, in the world that we're going to be in, meaning the kingdom of God, we're, we're not going to have enemies. We're not going to have that which is a source of fear, a source of problems, anything anything negative or, or that which brings discomfort or sadness. None of that is our eternal destiny. But in this world, we can experience that. And David is saying that God will hide him. He says it first person, for he will hide me in his, in his sukkah, in the day of evil. Now, there are days that evil manifests itself. Evil's always around. No matter where we go, evil is lurking. The question is, is evil going to move in a way against us? There are days that it does. And David is telling us when that day comes, God will hide us in a place of, of his dwelling. And the idea here, and the word that's chosen, is a word that speaks to trusting, being dependent upon another. So this sukkah, and I realize it's the word sukkah, but it's the same, same consonants in Hebrew. And it reminds us of, for example, the, the temporary dwelling places that the children had in the wilderness during those 40 years. And God was active. He was present. His provision was known. His protection was experienced. And that's why this word is used in this, this usage. He also says, look now to the second part of verse 5. Not only will he hide, but it's a similar word for hiding that he will hide me in the secret place of his tent. And in the rock, now some will say on, but it's literally in the rock, and that's why Paul uses that expression so frequently in Messiah. Messiah is that rock. He's the rock of our salvation. So he writes, and in the rock, he will lift me up. Now, when I'm in Messiah, I'm being lifted up. That's what Paul says about this upward call. So when I am in Messiah, doing his will, following his leadership, living him, living his life out through my life, I'm on an upward call that we can be assured of. And that upward call is a, a location of safety of God's protection. So once more, he says, in the rock, he will, will lift me up. Verse six. And now, 
This is a word of urgency. And now my head he will lift up over my enemies all about and all the places that David says he would go. So around him, God is doing something, lifting up David's head. Now we know another psalm speaks about God being the lifter of the head. What does that mean? Well, we also see that expression in the book of Luke, chapter 21 and verse 28, where it says, when you see these difficult things in the last days, lift up your head for your redemption draws near. And lifting up the head is a Hebrew idiom that should give us encouragement. But what it literally means is that God's going to recognize, acknowledge us that we belong to him. So David is telling us that in these, these difficult times, what can we expect? That God will acknowledge us in all about places, wherever that we happen to be. And what does David want to do? As I said, David is committed to worshiping and worshiping God. How? Notice what he says. I will sacrifice in his tent the sacrifices of joy. You know, the only thing I know about complaining in the Bible is that God says, don't complain. We need to come before him joyful. Come before him willing to, to give, to render up unto him tokens of praise, visible, visible uh, evidence that we are thankful, that we are joyful. Why? We're in a covenantal relationship with him. Now, I'm in another covenantal relationship with him and with my wife, the three of us. And it would be insulting if I said to someone, and my wife was there overhearing, how's your life? My life is awful. My life is a source of despair. I'm never happy. It is just, what would that, that bring about in her thoughts? Now, we may go through times that are not pleasant, difficult. We may have times of despair. But, but overall, because I am married to whom I married to, my life is good. She is a source of joy. And I'm going to emphasize, I'm going to put the emphasis on the good times and not let those, those other times overshadow or bring about a, a, a forgetting, a, a lessening of those good times. So we need to do that same thing with God. God, and just do this, we have so much to be thankful for. You may be in a very difficult circumstance. You may be a victim of injustice. We'll talk about that in a moment. But, but you have a glorious eternity. What you might endure, and I don't want to be unsympathetic, uncaring about what some people, no fault of their own, what they're going through. And even, and I could give so many examples of this, where someone does something and they seem to either get a slap on the wrist. No one knows about it. People forgive them. There's no consequences seemingly. Nothing happens by that, that wrong action, that sinful deed. And someone else does that same thing. But the consequences, earthly consequences, seem to be so much greater. Now, don't blame God. You know, the scripture says that we can be a, a victim of time, meaning bad timing in this case, and, and simply circumstances. I might be walking down the street and a tree falls. And that tree happens to fall exactly where I happen to be at that moment. So the, the tree was going to fall. Bad timing, bad location. 
Other people walk right past that same place a few minutes earlier. They're gone. They don't even know about it. Now, we can be a victim of, of time and circumstances in no way, in no way. Does that attack the sovereignty of God or God's providence? It simply means we're in a fallen world. There are things that are ungodly, not his will, that manifest themselves in this world that is stained by sin. And that sin can affect the innocent and also the not so innocent. But as I said, sometimes the same situation, two different people do the same thing, and the consequences can be very, very different. And that can be tragic for that one person. But my point is this. Realize that too will pass. It will come to an end, at least at the end of your life. And don't feel that you've been cheated because you have eternity if you're in a covenantal relationship with God. So this is why we have reason to be thankful. And David says, I will sacrifice in your tent another relationship to the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, sacrifices of joy. And I will sing, and then another word for sing, usually we say, I will sing and I will praise, but it's two words that have to do with singing. One generally, the other one more often than not related to praise and worship. So he says, I will sing and I will sing Two different words unto the Lord. Verse 7. Hear, O Lord, my voice. I will call. And be gracious unto me and answer me. What David is looking for is God's response in his life. Now, hear this. God is able. He is willing to respond to your life. But but invite him. Share with him these things that are going on, that are difficult. And part of our responsibility is to pray to him, name these things, and bring them before him. Because if you don't, and God does, you're not even going to know it's God. And God in the same way that you want him to pay attention to you, you pay attention to him. So part of prayer is disclosure. And you are wise if you make full disclosure of your life to God. That's what being transparent before him, and that's what brings a mighty response. And that's why David says, Be gracious unto me and answer me. Verse 8. Now, verse 8 is a little bit hard to translate, literally, based upon the words that are there. Probably if you're looking at an English or a different language text, you'll find uh, words in italicized or in parentheses to tell you that the translator added them in order to help clarify the, the choppiness and the abruptness of the Hebrew. It says in Hebrew, the first part, lecha. Amarli B, Bakshu Panai. Now, if we just read it, it's to you, my heart has said. And we're going to see what the heart says in a moment. But it's a response from what God has said to David. David, in making these prayers, apparently, and we have a quotation where it says, Bakshu Panai. Now, Bakshu is in the plural, it's a command and the imperative, but in the plural. And God has said, not just to David, but God has said to all humanity, seek my face. What does that mean? Seek my presence in your life. God has pronounced that to all humanity. Creation, the fact that there is creation and there's an order to creation. We see not chaos in this world. When we look at nature, yes, there can be, which reveals the power of of nature, which God puts into being. He created it. So it even speaks more about him. 
but this order to creation. This speaks about the fact that there is God, a God of order. And a wise one, based upon God's revelation, they will seek him. And that's what God has said to all humanity. Therefore, David says, my heart has said to you, your face, O Lord, I will seek. What is David doing? David is taking the instructions of God and applying them to his life. I want to share something. And if you ignore this, if you do not implement this into your life, you are going to have eternal disaster and it's just that that clear if you are not someone that seeks and finds God's revelation his instruction spiritual truth if you don't find that how awful your your eternity will be and it's not enough just to find it but also you must Receive it, digest it, apply it to your life. That's when God's change comes about. His provision is able to be received. His power is upon you and in you and through you. And you're going to see God at work in your life. You ignore God's revelation. Just what he says here. My face, you seek. Seek God's presence. And how do you do that? By implementing his word into your life. There's no other way. And it's so sad that so many, 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 many people, the vast majority, are uninterested with God. And, and people think that if you, you dress a certain way, if you have smoke in your sanctuary, if you have enough lights going on there and such, that that's going to bring people to the truth. It will not. It is a representation of the world. It is not something with spiritual authority, but it's simply a manipulation. Do not, see, you might manipulate people in the flesh, but, but we're not about building up the flesh. Some people are interested in the flesh. They just want to see people in their, their, their houses of worship, people buying their books, people, they're just into flesh. But we ought not be. We cannot manipulate the soul. Don't even try. Don't waste the time. What do you do to speak to the soul of the individual to bring about lasting, eternal change? You give them truth. Just that simple. Give them truth. And no matter what you're wearing, it's not important. Whether your, your approach, your style is very casual, that's fine. Dress casual. If you come from a tradition that things relating to God and, and worship, you're a little bit more formal, that's okay. Those things are, are the outer. We want to provide the inner the truth that penetrates that, that inner man. That's what it's about. So the packaging is what we not focus in on. Truth is what we have to give people. And that's what David is saying here. Seek truth. That's how you seek the face of God. Verse, verse 8. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn in anger, your servant. So he's saying here, David's confessing something here. David wants to experience God's presence. But David realizes he's not perfect. What does he, he deserve? God's anger. And this is a word that relates to God's anger, God's, the God's discipline, or God's wrath. And what David is saying here is, it's a confession. I realize that I deserve your anger. But don't turn me away in anger. Why? Notice how David calls himself, your servant. I deserve your wrath, but I want to serve you. 
for you, notice what he says, my help you have been. David has experienced that in the past, that God has helped him. And now, perhaps David, he has messed up. Perhaps he has, has failed in some way. But what does he do? He doesn't say, oh God, I, I'm not going to pray to you. I'm not going to turn to you. I'm not going to seek your grace. I'm not going to seek your presence in my life. He doesn't do that. He realizes, I deserve anger. But David says, you have been a help for me in the past, and I'm going to affirm, affirm that I'm in a covenant relationship with you. And how does he do that? By saying, your servant. Verse, verse 9 at the end. Do not, and I want to pay attention to these words. There's two words, lintosh and the word lazof. Lintosh, the first time I, I came across that, I was visiting Israel, and I, I saw a home that was abandoned, one that obviously no one had lived in for a long, long time in the north of Israel, in the upper Galilee, in the city of Tzvat. And, and I said to someone in the little Hebrew at that time that I could muster up, I said, you know, basically, manyan ima bayit hazeh. What's the, the issue, the matter with this, this house? And the person says, bayit natush. What is that? It means it's a house that's abandoned, one that, that is basically no one has any claims to it. Well, this is the word that's used here. So he says, do not, do not abandon me. Do not just act as though God has no ownership over David. That's what he's saying. Do not abandon me. Do not leave me. This is the second word, la zof. Do not abandon me. Do not leave me. God of my salvation. Now, what he's doing, and God loves when his people speaks truth unto him. David is saying, don't abandon me. Don't just leave me to myself. Just don't walk away from me. Why? Because you are the God of my salvation. You have entered into a covenant where God is obligated to bring salvation ultimately to us and eternally. That is our future. And salvation, it is a, a spiritual, religious word that we hear, but it's, it's simply, it conveys the word victory. David is saying, God, I've entered into a covenant with you. I'm your servant. I am seeking your presence, and I know that you are the source of my victory, my salvation. Verse 10. For my father and my mother, and the implication is, they have abandoned me, but the Lord, he will gather me up. So even when you are abandoned, forsaken, put away, by others and think about this now we're dealing with parents and he says even and that's the implication if my father and my mother should abandon me leave me but you O oh Lord that's the implication but the Lord he will gather me up now he says that and notice the next thing he writes it's word horani this is from the word Torah instruction so he says basically we could translate it simply teach me O lord your way now your way we see elsewhere in the scripture that this word way derech has a lot a lot of of significance messiah says he is the way the early followers of Messiah were called the, the people of the way. And David is saying here, and this word is related to 
what we just talked about, salvation. David wants to know the way of victory in his life. So he says, God, O Lord, teach me your way and lead me in the, the path. This is the word orach. It's a way of what? Mishor. Mishor comes the word for straight, meaning upright. The way that's not crooked. The way that's not uh, inconvenient in the sense that it's not the right way for us. That word inconvenient just doesn't mean an interruption, but it means something that is, is not right. It's, it's related to, in an adverse way, for that which is like, we would say, orthopedic. Orthopedic is straight. It, it, it's a word of strength, a word that, that produces an outcome. If you have problems and you need orthopedic help, your, your whatever it needs that is going to be weak. It's not going to be functioning. So David is saying here, teach me your truth, the way to go, enlighten me so that I'm led in the pathway that is straight, where I will have strength, where I will function properly. And he does that, says that on account of my enemies. David is being attacked. Several times we've seen that in this psalm. And he wants to know the right way to go in order to experience victory. That these enemies would not, not have their purposes fulfilled against David. Verse 12. And do not, not give me be nefesh sarai. Now, Sarai is an enemy, so it's my enemy. But the word nephish here can be talked, it's the word for soul, but it's also could be your soul's desire. So what David is saying here, in my opinion, do not uh, uh, give me over to the desire, the will, the appetite of my enemy. For they rise up against me. Who rises up against him? Notice this. A day shekher. False witnesses. So now, not only does David have opponents, but he has people who are testifying, but they're lying against him. We, we shouldn't be surprised by that. People are going to lie against the children of God. But what does David reveal here? Four false witnesses have risen up against me. And they breathe, and this might be breathe threats of, of violence or mediate out violence. And this is the word, not alimut. Today in Hebrew, you find the word alimut in the newspapers. Not so much Hamas. Hamas, if you're talking about that terrorist group, obviously, but... For the word violence, this is a word that's different than alimut. Alimut is violence. But, but Hamas is also violence. It looks the same, feels the same, does the same tragic damage. But there's a difference. Oftentimes, alimut has a purpose. Maybe not a proper purpose, not a righteous purpose, but there's a reason, perhaps not a justifiable reason, but there's a reason for it. Hamas, the cause of that violence is that the one loves to see the pain, the suffering, the misfortune of others. And this is a, a psychopathic violence. It delights the one who is violent to see another one suffer. Verse 13. Now, this is a word, maybe the best way to translate it is unless. Unless I had believed, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now, there is a, a debate whether here in this world, the land of the living, or he's talking about the land of the living the kingdom of God. It says, I've come that you might have life 
And oftentimes, life, when it speaks of it in the scripture, it's not, I've come that you might have life. But, but in Hebrew, we would translate it, I've come that you might have the life, a specific type, quality, description of life. And that's a kingdom life. And, and I believe that David is saying here, my hope is not rested in this world, what I experience here on this planet. But, but my, my faith, I believed that I would look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And notice the last verse, verse 14. Twice the same sentence appears. Now, most English Bibles have it for, for waiting. And has a degree of that. But more this word. There's a word lechakot. To wait. Lamtin. Wait. But this is word lekavot. To hope. So literally. And hope makes us. It gives us endurance. It gives us patience. It causes us to wait. But he says. Hope. Literally to the Lord. We would understand it in English. Hope in the lord my hope is in him and he says that when we have a biblically based hope rooted in the promises of god what god's word has revealed it is going to make us strong and courageous in our hearts so that's why he says strong and courageous is your heart everyone who hopes in the lord they are going to have a strong and courageous hope. And therefore, he says it again, hope in the Lord. Now, let me close out this study with one last biblical principle. Here it is. We began by talking about fear. And it might be someone who says, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid. I am being parallel, paralyzed by fear. That's what I'm experiencing, okay? How do you deal with that? Hope. Yes, we know that the love of God, being experiencing that, cast out all fear, but we see another tool, another instrument, another biblical principle. And when I focus in on hope, there is an inherent relationship, biblically speaking, between hope and the promises of god so when i focus in on hope in the lord means i'm focusing in on his promises and as i think more and more my life is is pursuing the promises of god that is going to push fear out so when a person says i'm afraid I have fear. Realize this is because you are not emphasizing. You're not focusing in on the good promises of God. What you're going to have in his kingdom. Fear is set aside when we take hold by means of hope in the kingdom promises of God. Shalom. From Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.